Our next speaker is Dr. Jacob Olapuna. Olapuna. Dr. Olapuna is professor of African American religious traditions at Harvard Divinity School. His books include City of 201 Gods, Ife Ife in Time, Space, and the Imagination, Orisa Devotion as World Religion, The Globalization of Yoruba Religious Culture, and Kingship, Religion, and Rituals in a Nigerian Community, a Phenomenological Study of Ondo Yoruba Festivals. Professor Olapuna was named one of the Walter Channing Cabot Fellows in 2012. He's been awarded the Nigerian National Order of Merit. He's been awarded the Martin Marty Award for the Public Understanding of Religion. He's received a Guggenheim Fellowship on an honorary doctorate and countless other honors. His paper this morning is entitled Global Christianity, Challenges, Concepts, and Prospects. Please join me in welcoming Professor Olapona. Uh, good morning to you all. I guess it's still morning. Yes. Um, I'm sorry, I couldn't start with you. I have another assignment to uh, virtually connect with Harvard University that is responsible for giving me my daily bread. Uh, but it's unbelievable that the uh, meeting was about uh, the creation of a new uh, program or initiative called uh, the Global Task Force to think about uh, where Harvard Divinity should uh, be um, moving and how Harvard Divinity School should respond to some of the issues that we're talking about. So I seized the opportunity to tell them what we are doing here today. And it's an honor to be invited. I want to thank the donor for making this possible. And I want to thank my friends and colleagues at the University of Chicago. And for me, it's a particularly important uh, visit because uh, since I was given the Mati Mati uh, award by the AR in the Public Understanding of Religion. I wanted to sort of come to visit Chicago and visit the institution where uh, Matthew uh, works. So thank you very much. World Christianity, the African experience. In the old schema of the history of religions, Christianity has always been considered one of the major world religions. What is new about invoking Christianity as a world religion in the 21st century is the question that we all need to address. The answer partly has to do with the major centers or locales of religion and how they have shifted in significant ways in recent times. Christianity in the global south particularly in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, has become a major player, decisively shaping the contours of Christianity in the world today. And what does it mean to theorize and teach from the Global South perspective? As one scholar puts it, what are the promises and limitations of the paradigm of the Global South? The truth of the matter, of course, is that unlike in other disciplines, such as anthropology, uh, literature, and cultural studies, which are equally concerned with issues surrounding the global south, the religious studies ascent on non-Western Christianity has made significant shifts in the interrogation of perspectives, approaches, paradigms, and implications that affect Christian realities outside of the West. In my opinion, Christian religious uh, scholarship has not really been concerned with understanding the social, political, historical, cultural implications uncovered by these perspectives. I must thank uh, the last speaker for talking about uh, polygamy 
uh, I just came back from Nigeria. I arrived on Monday. And during my visit, I ran into a childhood friend who is now a big shot in Nigeria. How he reminded me of something that happened in 1958 when my father was a priest in his local church and we were classmates in the primary school. He said, Jacob, do you remember that your father did something to us that wasn't too good? He prevented my mother and members of my family from taking the Holy Communion because they were accused of being, I mean, or they were accused of polygamy. So in other words, as you just said, the CMS forbidden them from taking Holy Communion because they belong to this polygamous family. Can you imagine almost 60 or 50 years after that, my friend reminded me of what happened when we were young. This is why this initiative is very important uh, uh, to us, particularly historically, socially, and culturally. Thus, the question for contemporary scholarship should not be whether Christianity in the global north still matters. The global north may no longer be the normative center of world Christianity, but as scholars, we should be more concerned with the political, social, and religious implications of the shift, the world Christianity, from the north to the south, and what this means for this age-old faith tradition uh, uh, today. As we all know, the shift is reflected in demographically and geographically. How many Christians are there in the world today, and where are they located? The statistics are constantly you know, coming up, and some of us do take the statistics seriously. The historical transformation of Christianity as a world religion is important, and calls for significant re-examination of how Christianity should be studied. Where is this studied? Who are the key figures and groups involved in the study? And what are the problems that scholarship faces uh, today? For example, what does it mean for us to see the once vibrant seminaries in Boston and the Van Newton Theological Seminary and the Episcopal Divinity School closed right before our very eyes? Why countries of the global south are desperately looking for spaces to train their emerging scholars and clergy? Occasionally, I go to some of these new movement Pentecostal charismatic evangelicals, and as I walk in there, they will you know, introduce uh, some pastors, some people, say, meet our theologians. And of course, I know they never went to any the solid theological uh, schools, but they are already using our vocabulary to call them theologians. What does that mean for us? And what does it mean, the study of world Christianity? However, as I argue in a keynote address at a conference similar to this one at the Princeton Theological Seminary in February 20, uh, 2018, we must be careful not to assume or think that the center of gravity has completely shifted from the global north to the global south. The resources, personnel, infrastructures of what Christianity are still firmly based in the global north. At this particular conference I refer to, the three key professors who organize it are from the global south. But they work at Princeton Theological Seminary. They were responsible for, you know, rep uh, uh, for organizing uh, the conference, uh, Asia, uh, Afri uh, Africa, and um, Latin America. So the question is, for me, and I think for some of us, that he who pays the piper dictates the tune of global Christianity in which we are all engaged. So what global Christianity means to me then begins from this positionality and this conceptual uh, constructs. In other words, I don't want us to begin to deceive ourselves about this shift from the north to the south. We need to understand the realities that we are faced with. One of the things I said this morning in talking to my colleagues at Harvard is that in terms of the numbers of students who come to the Divinity School, there are very few from Africa. It's so expensive to bring African scholars and African students to come to these places to study. So what does that then mean? 
my own position is that we need to shift the focus of how we train these students. And right now, since 2017, I've been involved in what I call a summer institute in Nigeria, uh, which is, of course, of course an African-based one, whereby we bring professors from the North, uh, Europe, and America, and also other African countries to Africa to train, to help in training pre-doc and post-doc students and scholars in the social sciences and the humanities. It's a success story. Uh, if you want to know more about it, I will, I will let you know. The first thing I want to look at is global Christianity and the global South, issues of definition and identity. What does the field of global Christianity mean in the African context? What would the pursuit of a new areas of scholarship contribute to the understanding of Christianity in Africa? And how does it differ from previous approaches to the study of African Christianity, particularly what is normally referred to as missiology and church history? And what are the major themes in world Christianity that are germane to African scholarship uh, today? I do not regard the distinction between world Christianity and global Christianity as important. Uh, I'm referring to uh, the suggestion made by my senior colleague and late uh, colleague, uh, Professor Lamin Sani. Uh, my, the distinction for me appears to be one of semantics, because both terms refer to the study of Christianity in contemporary global context as a form of world religions similar to the way that Islam, Buddhism, and Hinduism have been understood. The caveat, however, is that the term raises a pertinent conceptual issues, issue worth considering. For a long time, world religions were regarded as those traditions that followed Karl Jaspers and later a revolving scheme on axial age civilization, including Christianity. And those of us who went to graduate schools in the 70s and early 80s will remember how important it was for us to read these two texts. These religions were regarded as traditions that arose at a certain historical period, defining the legal tone and identities of the so-called higher religions. While Christianity has always been considered a veritable member of this club, it was primarily seen in its Euro-Christian context as a tradition that was subsequently, that subsequently spread to the Southern Hemisphere through European missionaries. This tra tradition produced the innovative framework of Christianity around the globe. However, all recent available statistics suggest that the demography of the Christian tradition has emerged from these old mission centers in Africa, Asia, and so on, have now surpassed the Christianity of the, uh, the Northern Hemisphere in numbers and influence. This development is leading towards a necessary rethinking of the nature, status, and power dynamics in the Christian faith tradition across the world. It is imperative, therefore, that we begin to attend to Christianity in the global south in innovative and creative manner. We must learn its content and understand its contours so as to give the Christian tradition there a voice in the conversation. Things have changed. It is no longer business as usual, and we must understand that. African Christianity comes to the global north. A brief general outline of Christianity in Africa today may look something like this. Africa, at the beginning of, of Christianity, asserted itself as a significant actor in the narrative of the Christian church. The early church, Medivia Christianity, the Portuguese Christian mission that came in the 15th, 16th centuries, European Christian missionaries, independent African churches, the charismatic Pentecostal churches, in that chronological order, we all know. All of these may represent different epochs in the long line of Christian history on the continent of Africa. 
In writing the modern history of Christianity, African agency must be central to this new narrative that I'm talking about. By this, uh, but this means that quite a number of the received interpretations of Christianity need to be revised so that the important roles of Africans in the early history of Christian church can come to light. Having taught uh, uh, a course called uh, uh, African uh, Christianity and Civil Society uh, for many, many uh, uh, years, one major observation has been that the African sources for understanding this kind of exercise are often found in very remote places. One must then look beyond libraries, archives, and even the books that originally would have been seen as marginal to mainstream Christian historiography. In order to be able to do that, we must then uh, uncover the authentic histories of the Africans and the roles they played in the formation of the Christian church on the continent. For example, uh, I, I remember uh, uh, you know, one of the, the, the blessings of my life was that I was able to go to many places with my parents, there were missionaries. I used to tease my father I was a missionary, you know, a local missionary in Nigeria. And everywhere we went, the natives would create language, vocabulary, in the Christian tradition to describe their experience as Africans. We can finally find any of this thing in any book, in any library. How do we then understand what we regard as, say, African Christian experience if we don't take very seriously this particular uh, um, uh, phenomenon. The second consideration to examine is the history of the African Christian encounter with the global North itself. In, the, in 1990, I coined the term reverse mission. If you've seen that term, that first came up in 1990 when I had uh, uh, a project uh, to, to, to address. The term describes the phenomena of Christian missionaries entering spaces in Northern Hemisphere, particularly the United States, Europe, uh, and to some extent, uh, Asia. Christian missionaries from the continent use this term themselves to describe their understanding of the nature of their mission and evangelical act activities in America and Europe. The term, of course, place upon the idea of the 18th, 19th century European missionaries who were sent by their churches to evangelize Africans. As product of this evangelization, Africans now feel empowered to return to the old mission post and embark in reverse on the same kind of missionary work that their great grandfathers witnessed in Africa. There is a sense now that it is the West which requires evangelization. And so Africans have taken up the charge and entered in the global north. In reality, we can count the presence of African missionaries in our midst through the lens of this African missionary uh, uh, themselves. All we have to do is to look at what happens in Kiev, in, 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 you know, in old Eastern Europe, when a missionary called Pastor Adilaja uh, began his evangelization mission, and very soon he virtually took over the whole place. Uh, Russia played, paid attention to him. He influenced the election of the local mayor of the city, uh, and he became pretty important until, of course, they scandalized him to find a way of driving him out. Similarly, another thing happened in England when a Nigerian uh, 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 missionary uh, started his own church based on this same notion of reverse mission. By name of Ashimalo, he flowered very well. He had thousands of you know, uh, uh, members uh, that converted or that uh, came with him or that also joined his church. And all of a sudden, when Britain noticed that he was trying to get out of order, they decided to cut him to size by making sure that he would not have a, uh, he wanted to build his church at the center of London. Uh, the moment you hear hearing what Kingswood Parish and Kingswood is and Kings with this, you know there's something there. So they quietly said to him, you know what, you should pack your loads and go back to your country. You don't belong here. 
So the tensions between the South and the North is clear. The numbers are amazing. And Europe is taking notice, and Europe is scared uh, uh, of them. So all over Europe and United States, for instance, one finds African Catholic a priest working in different dioceses, just as the European and American priests did in Africa years ago. So the idea of reverse mission, however, should also be considered in view of distinct encounters between the global north and the global uh, south, particularly in the interaction of new immigrants and their host congregations. Several years ago, I was in Miami as a visiting uh, professor. And one of my students said, Professor, we would like you to come to our church on Sunday. In good faith, I took that. Uh, it was a time when you have to have a cell phone, and you have to be able to speak Spanish to enjoy life in Miami. And I didn't have any. So I went to this church. What did I see? The homily was given by an Igbo Nigerian priest. Flawless Spanish. So we got out and I said, come. My brother, you are a Nigerian. How did you get here? I found out that this guy speaks French, uh, uh, Italian, uh, Igbo, uh, Spanish, and, uh, and of course, English. He was fully in charge of this church in Miami. Let me quickly move to the next one. African Christianity, indigenous knowledge, and contextualization. Reflection on global Christianity and the role of Africans requires that we take seriously African culture and tradition. A key instance of this pertains to the rise of Pentecostal charismatic movement in Africa. Some African culture experience this movement as altering certain cultural traditions, or what I would call a deculturalization process. In other words, the new Pentecostal charismatic encounter that we're having is taking a totally different uh, uh, take on what we often call culturalization in the 60s and so on. The opposite of this enculturation, which encourages Africans to explore Christianity within the parameters of African culture and tradition, was a topic of fruitful discussion and debate uh, uh, in the Second Vatican Council. The result of which was the process of Africanizing or contextualizing certain European Christian traditions on the continent at that time. This period witnessed the flowering of Christianity in Africa as a result of the Christian encounter with African indigenous institutions. It was the era when African Christianity was given the platform it deserves. One of the reasons why the independent African churches flowered after the era of the mission churches was because they had the space to Africanize European Christianity. In the, same, the more contemporary period, the period I refer to as the Pentecostal charismatic period, the deculturation process of Pentecostal charismatic spirituality, a movement that has provided significant mileage to Christianity on the continent, will, I believe, ultimately deprive Africans of their Africanness, their African's identity, including their language, a liturgy, dresses, the old notion of extended family structures, and so on. I don't have the time here to talk about the dignity of this particular process. But one of the things that is very disturbing to us is that the kinds of African institutions, uh, 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 rituals, uh, uh, that were created through this process of the independent African church uh, movement are now being turned on their heads by Pentecostal charismatic uh, institutions and so on. Just as Lame Sane, a major work translating the message, the missionary impact on culture uh, uh, emphasized the importance of the Bible, the translation of the Bible into native languages. I remember Professor John Mbiti telling me years ago when I was trying to you know, uh, do a book in his honor that whenever the Bible is translated in an African language, people go wild. They're able to read the word of God in their own native, native tongues itself. So what does it then mean today for an African bishop to say to members of his diocese, 
do not use Yoruba or Igbo in liturgy. You have to use English language. We have suddenly know there are Bishop Crowder who took the time to translate uh, 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 the Bible into Yoruba language and part of Igbo language will really be unhappy in his, his, in his grave listening to what the African bishops uh, uh, are doing. So this critic and many others should also form part of the conversation in the study of global Christianity. I should quickly add that the popularity of the Pentecostal charismatic movement, both in its local and transnational and global forms, have further eroded the extended family value system, vernacular languages, and imbibed a new form of ethic that supported the autonomous individualism, global capitalism at the expense of communal life affirming ethos. Next, reimagining Christianity in Africa as a world religion methodological consideration. I would like to now turn to a few methodological issues. In today's academic field and the, in the intellectual pursuit of knowledge, the sign of progress uh, the signs of progress are often seen through theoretical innovations that encourage scholars and researchers to, to deploy imagination to rethink the theory and methods that have been in currency over a period of time. That is why in all our schools, particularly in the, in the, in, in the seminaries, we keep creating what they call method and theory courses for whether they are MTDV or MTS, and you know, we'll try it for two, three years. We'll say, no, there's something wrong with this. We we'll now begin to change that. And at times, we are so confused about what we mean by that. Uh, we, we reminded ourselves this morning when we were discussing this same uh, problem. Now, uh, why world Christianity has you know, spoiled us into developing conceptual analysis and unearthing historical political, social, and mythological issues that are maintained uh, germane to the study, I believe that we are very much in a deficit of innovative theoretical insights that could move this conversation forward. This is a matter we need to attend to urgently. Several recent developments in world Christianity discourse call for a creative exercises, such as the old one that we used to, 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 uh, to, uh, to witness. I refer here to the very important article by uh, uh, Robin Horton, you know, on conversion, which is still cited today. If you're working on conversion anywhere in the world, you have to cite the Horton's uh, uh, example, which was based on a review of a book by J.D. Pill on Aladura Christianity uh, in Nigeria. What I'm trying to call for here is that kind of creativity, that kind of innovation, that will move the field forward uh, so that we begin, of course, to see uh, uh, our roles as scholars and interpreters in new life. Let me further lay out a few illustrations that could lead to deeper reflection and possibilities in theoretical innovation. At every age and, and time, we often talk about uh, religious fashion, what is in fashion in societies and cultures. This will refer to religious traits that are spearheaded by one form of Christian belongingness or the other that are then replicated by the entire society, but not necessarily only by members of our own religious tribe. For example, why do the mainline mission churches and Aladura independent African churches today tailor their religiosity towards more evangelical Pentecostal practices and habits? that are often associated with specific term of Christianity uh, designable in Pentecostal charismatic movements. What I'm trying to say here is that as we look at the African field, we can say with certainty that whereas all Pentecostal charismatics are evangelicals, but we cannot say that all evangelicals are Pentecostals and charismatics. So we must ask ourselves the questions, why is it that the Anglicans and, and, the, and, and the mainline churches and the independent churches, why are they trying to behave as Pentecostals, charismatics? These are issues that I think very important thing that we need to uh, answer. So are the mission churches and the lateral churches also Pentecostal? If the answer is no, then we require a new nomenclature 
and rubric that will embrace both the apples and oranges of Christian expressions in contemporary Africa. Can we talk about evangelicalism as a unifying descriptor for all who feel hold under this form of Christianity? If the answer is no, we must then be able, at the very least, to explain why the Methodists, the Anglicans, and the other rulers want to be like Pentecostals. Why is it that Pentecostal Christianity displays and maintains its form of religiosity with significant uh, success, at least from my own reckoning, with little or no theological education? Why is it that Pentecostal charismatic churches in African societies and nation states have become more visible in the public sphere than the old denominational churches, even to the extent of being regarded as state religions? I remember again from my own experience in 1970 uh, uh, or so, uh, when uh, the, the Anglican, the, the entire church was called to the palace, I mean to the governor's office for the, the uh, normal annual um, uh, uh, prayer meeting, and they all put on their robes. And the Aladura, you know, independent African church had this heavy stuff in there. And my father, who was like the head of the church at that time, because of his training in Western, Western theological uh, education, he, he had a church in England for two years, uh, told the man that he should go and, and stand at the front. He's not supposed to be standing behind him, because in the procession, and of course, in the African context, that procession is very important. You know, the, the, the big chief will, start, will stand at the, at, the, at, the, at the back of the procession. Now, if you fast forward, that kind of thing will not happen again. So the state church, if you like, is no longer the Anglican or the Methodist. They're the Pentecostal charismatic churches. What does that then mean for our study and the kinds of scholarship we are pursuing? As an interdisciplinary endeavor, scholars should also borrow tools from the humanities and social sciences to engage in interdisciplinary work, ethnography, historical, textual studies, and other scholarly approaches that are amenable to research in world Christianity. The effect of such radical scholarship, if we may call it that way, is that it will lead to a reinterpretation of what world Christianity is in both time and place. It reflects on the already existing published materials that came out of the scholarship of the previous uh, era, scholarship that contains significant biases and partnership, and that excluded the very agency of the subject that the research itself was focused on. There's a need for us to turn this thing uh, upside down. The new approach I'm calling for uh, 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 may be revolutionary you know, in context, uh, because it's going to query all the received knowledge of the Christian traditions and their interpretations among native, uh, native uh, uh, Africans. I'm going to fast forward uh, 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 pretty quickly and talk about Christian, Christianity's public presence on the continent. Christianity and the public sphere is another important category that ref requires significant attention. And I may have just, you know, uh, uh, by extension, talked about even uh, public policy uh, as it relates to uh, the role of the Christian tradition. The public sphere has become a major theater for not only the practice and expressions of Christian tradition in Africa, but also as a zone where major contestations of identity and power relations take place, particularly between the church and the state. It has also become a stake for questions, a question of justice, human rights relations between Christians with people from other faith traditions, particularly Islam. That is where the question, issues of Christian-Muslim relations in Africa is very central, and we need to focus on that. In the 1990s, African Christianity acted both locally and globally through its role in civil society following the decline and demise of USSR and communism and Eastern Europe. I'm here referring to the role of the church, particularly the, 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 the church, in the redemocratization process. Most of them were involved in the drafting of constitution for the state, they were involved in the election, they were involved, they were actively involved in making sure that a new order uh, takes effect. 
And I think we also need to look at it in, um, uh, in, 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 the, in, in this context. It's also well known uh, that religion is often able to articulate tensions and contradictions about identity, citizenship, and belongingness in any given uh, 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 society. What then is the role of the scholar in examining these questions in the face of social realities of Christians on the continent, particularly in those places where Christians may be in a minority or even where Christians are not necessarily a, a minority, but because of what the kinds of conflicts that are arising from the encounter with, say, Islam. And Nigeria is a classic example uh, based on you know, your knowledge of Boko Haram and, what, uh, and other things. Let me now conclude that I've tried, at least in some of this, uh, to discuss what I would consider to be some of the scholarly and heuristic importance of the Global South as part of, uh, as part of this entry into this conversation on global Christianity. But I've also tried as much as possible to look at what is shaping the conversation, uh, uh, particularly in relation to the intersection between Global South and, and Global North. And with particular reference to uh, African context, uh, which is my own different areas, but by implications, some of the things we are talking about do have impact on the larger spheres of global Christianity, be it in Asia in Latin, or Latin America. Let me also quickly add, and this is not quite uh, in my note, I've been having some conversations with Christians from the Middle East, those who were driven by the wars in Syria and all these places who have found themselves in, you know, uh, in America. And they keep asking, anytime you know, I introduce myself as a professor of religion, and then, they go, oh, are you a Christian? Uh, and I say, yes, I'm a Christian. You know fully well, but in terms of their own identity, their names are usually very, very uh, Middle Eastern. It's like uh, Islamic names. Even in Nigeria, you hear of uh, Canon Mohammed, uh, Father Kuka, uh, Ibrahim. Uh, these are all Muslim names, but they're Christians. And the major question they ask me is that, is America a Christian nation? Well, I said, I don't know. Uh, why is it that they have abandoned us? What is our role as scholars, particularly in the context of persecutions that Christians face all over the world? Are we in a position to enter the conversation? Are we in a position to enter the dialogue? Do we, based on the kinds of training that we have had in the secular context, uh, even if it's called a, 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 a Chicago Divinity School or it's called Harvard Divinity School, there are certain value system that are promoted. Are we you know, allowed to, uh, 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 to uh, uh, intervene in this? And when we ask these questions as scholars, what answers do we give? Are we qualified to give the kinds of answers? They, you know, a number of them are seeking for help. A number of them are seeking for answers to some of these deeply rooted questions. Thank you very much.